Are you ready for the word? I, I said, are you ready for the word? I am ready for the word, and we started a series last week called Change My Mind, and uh, we're, we're talking in the series the importance of not just allowing our mind to do whatever we want, but we actually need to be intentional about changing our mind, and I'm going to be pulling from a scripture in Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, and in this scripture, it starts with Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who were there were astonished. Where did this man get these things, they asked. Where did this wisdom come from? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? And isn't his brothers James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay a hand on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of of faith. You know, they missed out on what Jesus was able to do because of a belief that they had. And uh, in, in my life, uh, you know, growing up, I had a weird belief. And uh, it was a belief that um, I felt like I looked different from my siblings. And I felt like I, I didn't act like them. And I had different desires in life. And, and because of this, because of this false belief that I had, I thought I was adopted. Um, I was like, man, I just feel like there's nothing wrong with being adopted. I just felt like I was being lied to. And I was like, man, like, I, I, don't, I don't feel like I'm a part of this family. Like, you're lying to me. I feel adopted. And just through, throughout years, I was like, man, I just, I don't feel a part. I feel adopted. I would tell my brothers. I would tell my mom. I, I, would, I would just confess this. I feel adopted. It was ridiculous. And, um, and one night, we were eating dinner as a family and we were talking and I, I it came up again I was like man I just feel like I'm adopted and uh, my mom uh, got quiet and she started talking in an emotional voice she grabbed my hand and she was like hey Ryan um, I have something to tell you I've been meaning to tell you this for a long time and I just haven't figured out how I was going to tell you but I just I, it's hard for me to say this but I have been lying and you are adopted. And I just started, I freaked out. I was like, oh my gosh. I started crying and I ran away. I was like, you lied to me my whole life. I'm not, I'm adopted. And it turned out later on, she was like, I was just kidding. I was playing. And I was like, you're evil. You're an evil lady. You lied to me about lying to me that I'm adopted. You're an evil lady. And, and, and I believe something. And because of this belief, because of a, a lie, that I was believing, I started to uh, view my family in a certain way. I started to interact with them in a certain way because of the lie that I was believing. And I want you to know that it is very important the belief that we have in God. It is very important what we believe about God. And, you know, I think most people view Christianity wrong. I, I think they look at Christianity and they view it in the wrong way. This is so powerful. The gospel is that God is incredible. He's in heaven and he was separated from humanity because of humanity's sin. And God sent his son because he loved us. He wanted relationship with us. And he sent his son to die on a cross that we actually deserve. He shedded his blood so that we can be saved. That is, that's good news. That is incredible so that we can be saved. But not only that, three days later, he resurrected from the grave. That's incredible incredible. He died, he was, in, he was in the tomb, and he resurrected from the grave. And then later on, you know, he was gone about his day, then it said that he ascended to heaven. This man was floating in the clouds and on his way to heaven. And not only that, it said that he sent the Holy Spirit to be with us. So let me tell you this, Jesus didn't come just so that you can be saved and one day go to heaven, but he also came 
came so that you can have relationship with God. Did you know that you can have relationship with God? Did you know that you're not just having to do all of these different things, but you can actually have relationship with God? And I think because sometimes we view Christianity in the wrong way, we will, instead of living in relationship with God, we will just do rituals for God. We will just go through the motions and we will do all of the right things because we feel like that's what we have to do. I'm a Christian, so I have to do all of the right things. I'm a Christian, so I have to go to church. I'm a Christian, so I have to come and raise my hands in worship. And when people ask if I'm okay, I will smile and say, I'm okay. And, and we will go through the rituals and the duties of Christianity while at the same time missing out on the relationship that is available. That, that, that is a sad place to be to one day go to heaven eventually, but then we are living this world in this world apart from God and, and without relationship. And I'm going to just relieve some stress from you that you don't have to do rituals and duties to please God to, to, so that he can love you. He loves you, and that's why he sent his son Jesus to die for you so that he can be in relationship with you. We do good things. You know this? We do the good things because of our connection to want to please him. We don't do good things so that we can earn his love. And I think through our wrong understanding of Christianity, we have lost the ability to actually be in relationship with God. And in this life, because of this, because of our, you know, we're wanting, a lot of us, we want to live in relationship with God. We, we want, we all have this desire to please God and live in relationship with God. But along the way, we have had a wrong view shaped of God because of our earthly experiences. Did you know this? That our earthly experience will shape our view and it will shift our view of God. Did you know this? That, that what you go through on this earth will begin to put a filter up and then you will view God based on what you went through. You will begin to view God by what you have gone through. And I'll illustrate it to you like this. Uh, I have... Two kids, uh, my daughter is named Jessa, she's incredible, uh, and my son is named Malachi, and Jessa, she's a fearless girl. Like, we go to the park, and she just does everything. She's swinging and jumping and falling and rolling, and, and she's doing it all. She has no fear, and she doesn't have fear because she hasn't really gone through a lot of pain. There, there hasn't really been pain to shape her fear, and so when she's going through the park, we're trying to block her from going off the edge and walking down the slide and doing all the things to cause her pain. We're, 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 we're guarding her from injuring herself. Now, my son, on the other hand, he's gone through some things at that park. He, he's fallen. He's gotten bruised. He's been, he, he, he got blood, you know, he drew blood and all of these different things. And because he's experienced pain at the park, now he's navigating the playground a little bit differently. When he comes over to the edge that, that is a little scary where he can fall down, now he's a little timid and he's not going near that edge because he went through some pain. And his pain began to shift his mind. His pain shaped his mind. And I'm going to let you know the pain that we go through will shape our mind. The, the, the things that we experience will shape the way that we view things. And a lot of us have gone through many different difficult times. People may not even know what you've gone through. But I'm going to let you know that the pain that has happened to you has shaped something inside of you. And we have to be careful with how we view God because we are viewing him based on the pain that we've experienced. And, and if we're wanting this relationship with God, but we're viewing him like how we were treated by our parents, and instead of him being a loving God like he is, we will view him like he is a hateful God because of what we've experienced. And our minds have been shifted by the things that we have gone through. And there are so many people who have, have experienced even people mistreating you. And now you're trying to have a relationship with God, but now you're filtering God by that mistreatment that you experience. And now instead of living in a good relationship with him, you feel like he's going to mistreat you. 
because you've been rejected by people, you feel like whenever you try to come and have a relationship with God, that God is going to reject you. Because you've been overlooked at times, you now come to God and you feel like he can't even see you because of the pain that we've experienced. Have you ever experienced pain before? I think pain is universal. It is almost impossible to get away from pain. But if we aren't careful, we will allow that pain to overtake our mind and then we aren't able to actually have a relationship with God that he actually intends us to have. And that's why we need to change your mind. We can't just allow our mind to run rampant with all the pain that we've experienced. We will just experience pain, and then we will ignore that it even happened, and then we'll just go through life saying, oh, it's okay, I can fight through this, I can do that, I can do, no, no, we have to learn to change your mind. We can't just allow all of these thoughts and all of this pain run us and shape us. No, we have to change your mind. And watch this. If we change our mind, God can change our life. That, that is a very important thing for you to understand. If we can learn to change our mind, God will begin to change our lives. And I think there's a time right now, today, where you have the opportunity to change your mind. I don't care what you've gone through. I don't care what you've experienced. Our God is still a good God, and he wants to come in and help you shift and change your mind. God wants a relationship with you. And how do we change our mind? How, how do we do that? And I just have a few ways that we can do that. In verse 3, it says, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? The brothers of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. If we want to change our mind, we first need to identify the lie. Identify the lie. Growing up, um, I believed something about myself. Uh, I believed that I was stupid. Um, and just throughout, you know, I failed first grade because I wasn't at the academic level that you should have been to pass to go into second grade. And I had a very difficult time reading. And uh, the kids in the class, whenever it was like popcorn, they would pick me to read so that I can uh, struggle through the paragraph. If that's you, stop it. <laughs> if you're doing that, stop it. <laughs> uh, but they would pick them and, and, you know, pick me and I'm embarrassed and things that were very difficult for me, I felt like other people were doing it with ease. And so just throughout this, because of my experience, I'm now claiming that lie as truth. I'm saying, man, I am stupid. Man, I am going to fail this test. Man, I'm not going to be successful in life. Man, I, I, I'm not going to even graduate high school because I am stupid. And this, this lie became a truth, and now I was experiencing the very thing that I, was, that I was afraid of because I claimed it. And this lie became truth. And one day, I identified this, that this was a lie that I am not stupid, that I'm actually created by God for a purpose, and that God actually has something for me. And I, I, I started to understand that I wasn't stupid. I just learned differently than others, that, that maybe they learned this way and I learned this way. And, and now because I identified the lie, I'm able to be up here preaching the word of God with knowledge and wisdom because I identified the lie and now I'm able to step out in the calling that God has for me. The lie began to shape me and, and, and uh, what we believe is what we will experience. What a man thinketh, so is he. And what we believe, we will experience. These people in this chapter, in this uh, scripture, in this verse that we just read, the, these were people who believed that Jesus was ordinary. Do you hear their vernacular? Isn't this Mary's son? Isn't the, doesn't his brothers live with us? Doesn't his sisters live with us? Isn't this the carpenter? What they were saying is this man can't be anything special. He's just like us. He's ordinary. They viewed him as ordinary. And because they believed he was ordinary, they experienced ordinary. 
Because they, ex- they believed he was ordinary, they experienced ordinary. So that's why we need to be careful for what we are believing about ourselves is because if we start to believe it, we will start experiencing it. That's why whenever you're claiming that you're an anxious person, and you're not able to get out of the anxiety, we are claiming the lie that we are always going to be anxious. That's why whenever you feel like you're ugly and you believe the lie that you're ugly and that you'll never be beautiful like so-and-so or so-and-so, you're claiming the lie and now you're experiencing the truth of that because you have believed it. What we believe is what we will experience. And, and, and in John 8, 44b, it says, he has always hated the truth. It's talking about the devil because there is no truth in him. When he, uh, when he lies, it is consistent with his character for he is a liar and the father of lies. If the devil can, can get you to believe a lie, he can keep you from experiencing freedom. And that is what is so crazy about the devil is he is so sneaky with what he gets us to believe. He will start to affect certain things and say different things and whisper different things. And because of the things that we're believing, we aren't able to step into the freedom that is available. But I'm going to let you know that the devil cannot control what I believe. The devil cannot keep me down. The devil cannot define me. The only person that can define me is the King of Kings and the Lord of of lords our god is a god of truth so we need to stop believing in the devil who is a liar sit down sit down sit down i'm, I'm just getting started i'm just getting started the devil can get us to believe in a lie and he can keep us from freedom and there there are so many lies that we believe what what lie are you believing about yourself what what lie are you believing what who told you that you will never be anything Who told you that you can never be loved? Who told you that you'll always be a failure? Who told you that you you will never have any friends that actually build you and love you? Who who, who told you that? Who told you all of these things? And we we will have these lies that we're believing about ourselves and then we are trying to get out and we're, we're feeling stuck and it's shaping our mind and we're experiencing the lie that we're believing. What? We need, to, we need to start identifying the lies that we believe about ourselves, and we need to start identifying the lies that we believe about God. We will, we will see God, and it's, we'll start to say, he's a hateful God. He's a, he's a judgmental God. He's a God that will fail me just like everybody. What lies are you believing about God? Because the last time I checked, my shirt said, He is a good God. What does it say? God is good. And if my shirt says that God is good, you better believe that God is Come on now. (laughs) And we have a good God, but the devil has come in and he's gotten us to believe the lie that God is not good. That God is a distant God. That God will leave us and forsake us. That God will abandon us in the time of trouble. And we will start to believe the exact opposite of what is true. And we need to stop giving the devil so much power in the lies that he is convincing us to believe in. And this is, this is, this is so powerful. This is so powerful. I want to I say it like I wrote it. We can't defeat it. Unless we define it. We are ignoring all of these different lies that we're believing. And we're wondering why we're living in a place of defeat. But I'm telling you, if you can get the boldness tonight and start to identify and define the things that you're believing in, I'm going to tell you, you're going to have the power to defeat it. Because we have the king of kings, the strong, the great I am, who is linking up with us and giving us the ability to defeat the things that the devil has got us to believe in. We will be able to defeat it once we can learn to define. What are you believing about yourselves? And how else can we uh, uh, change our mind? Verse 5, it says, he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Secondly, if we want to change our mind, we need to identify the truth. So we need to identify the lie, and now we need to identify the truth. 
You know what's so crazy is that Jesus in this time, uh, you know, he, they, hear, they said, who, what are these miracles that he's doing? They were hearing rumor, rumors of the great things that Jesus was doing. He was going from city to city, healing people, raising people from the dead, healing people from blind eyes, getting people that were lame from birth. He was doing an incredible miracle. And do you know that the will of God, the will of Jesus in this moment was to do the same thing for this society, for his hometown? You know, in this time, there wasn't great doctors that could uh, provide medication and provide cash to get people better. If you got sick or if you got hurt, it really would cripple you and hurt you to where you can't do stuff. So they really needed miracles in the cities. And so Jesus wanted to come in and help and create a crazy revival in that city and see healing and all of the, the different things. But because they didn't see the truth, they didn't experience the miracles that Jesus wanted to do. They, Jesus had the capacity and the ability and the willingness to, but their belief in a lie stopped them from receiving what was available. We need to recognize the truth that is in Jesus. How do we recognize truth? I, I, let me give you some practical things. Because I'm yelling, I'm screaming, people are getting rowdy, it's awesome. But I want you to be able to go home and actually apply this in your life. So how, how do we identify truth? It's, it's simple and it's so overlooked and I, I just hope you catch it tonight and leave different. But it, it's so simple but so powerful. We, we find truth through the word of God. Yes. Through the word of God. Watch what it says in John 8, 31 through 32. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples. You are truly Christians. You are truly followers of me if you remain faithful to my teaching, or in other words, to the word of God. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So if we want to know the truth and we want to be set free, we need to stick to the words of Jesus. We need to read the Bible. And, and this, is, this is kind of my routine whenever I read the Bible. I read it, but I don't just only read it, I meditate on it. So I get different verses that I go over in my mind and I just start to think about it and, and, and really try to understand it and allow the Lord to speak through me. I don't just meditate on it, I start to memorize it. I start to memorize it and not only memorize it, but I start to declare it. I start to declare it. And, and, and if we can read it, if we can meditate on it, if we can memorize it, and if we can declare it, we will start to have our minds transformed. There will be a new, a new, almost different pathway that we're creating in our mind. And, and this is what we can do. Once we identify the lie, we can replace it with the truth. So we will, we will get the lie and it's like, oh man, I'm, ex I'm anxious. Okay, now we need to go to our Bibles and we need to find the truth, what the word of God says, so that we can declare it over what we believe, the lie that we believe. And, and this is a crazy thing is that a lot of us have dealt with pain and certain beliefs for years, maybe since you were a kid and you've, developed pathways in your mind of certain beliefs and it's taken you so much time to develop those different ways of thinking so you're going to the bible one time and looking for a quick fix but i'm going to let you know if we want true freedom we need to consistently go to the word and not abandon it when we're in times of trouble the best time for you to go to the word of god is whenever you're in a bad time when someone broke your heart when someone left you whenever you failed we need to go to the word of God so that we can create a new mind within us also we need to go to the word of God but we also need to go to the presence of God in John 14 26 it says but when the father sends the advocate as my representative this is the Holy Spirit he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you he will remind you of everything I told you. Watch this. In the presence is where God brings remembrance. 
in his presence is where God brings remembrance. And so a lot of the times when we're going through hard times and we're feeling a certain way and we're feeling distance from God, we will run from God and we will separate ourselves from God. But I'm gonna let you know, instead of running away from God whenever you're in hard times, how about you press in to the presence of God? Because watch this, when you press into the presence of God in the seasons of hurt, in the seasons of pain, God will remind you of what he told you in your past. God will remind you that you're a son of God. God will remind you that you're a daughter of God. God will remind you that you are chosen. God will remind you of the things that he has spoken in his word and God wants to remind you he wants to be, bring remembrance in his presence and we get so caught up th this is a crazy thing people will lean one way or, or the other uh, having the presence of God without the word of God will lead to confusion We'll have the presence, oh, we love you, Lord, oh, but we have no truth to base anything off of, so we are going into confusion. And we will have the word of God without the presence of God, and it will lead to works, or it will lead to religion, or duties that we're doing for God, because we're trying to do all of the things and prove ourselves and do the right thing, but, but it will lead to works. But when we have the word of God, and when we have the presence of God, it will lead to truth true relationship. And I believe there's a few young people in here tonight that is sick of an ordinary Christian walk and who is ready for relationship. Is there anybody in here tonight that is saying, I am done with just going through the motions. I am done living an ordinary life and I am ready for a true relationship with God. If you're ready for a true relationship with God, how about you give him some praise? How about you thank him for his goodness? How about you thank him for his faithfulness. We are so grateful for a good God.